Dr. Christopher Exley is the reader in bioinorganic chemistry at the Birchill Center, Keeley University in Staffordshire, and honorary professor at the UHI Millennium Institute. He is a biologist at the University of Stirling with a PhD in the ecotoxicology of aluminium. His topic is a mechanism of toxicity of aluminium-based adjuvants. Good morning, and uh, I guess first things first, uh, incredible gratitude to uh, Al and Claire Dwoskin for organizing this uh, fantastic meeting. We only have 45 minutes to save the world, so I'm going to get right on with my talk. And I am going to talk about my favorite element, aluminium. I'm going to give us some background to that, some of which, which I hope will help the following talks as well. So I, I haven't got time to dwell on any particular aspect because I want to give you a short story which is vaccine related. But clearly, I am more than happy to talk to anybody about any part of it that we bring up today or indeed anything to do with aluminium whatsoever. So this is what we have to do. We, just, we have to have this balance between our exposure, the burden, and our excretion of aluminium to understand how much aluminium there is in us and where it is. The obvious one, perhaps, is in what we drink. So we are exposed both through the stomach, certainly through inhalation across the lungs and the nose, there is plenty of water vapor which, or anything of that sort which we're taking in and potentially can get inside of us in that way. I put the little question mark by the skin. We always believed, didn't we, that the skin is this impervious barrier, protects us from everything. You know, and then and we all poo-pooed the cosmetic companies that were producing all these compounds that said directly delivers to a particular site. And then nicotine patches came along and everyone accepted that you could get nicotine across the skin by popping a nicotine patch on it. And many, many, many other examples now of the skin is not as impervious as we thought. And while I don't know, my guess is that if I did have a bath with, in, the, in alum salts instead of bath salts, I'm pretty confident that my next urine sample would have more aluminium in it than the one before. So the skin is not completely impervious to aluminium in water. We know it's not impervious in other forms. Clearly what we eat, both directly through the gut and also sometimes parenterally, when we has, food has to be injected, the, the contamination of parenteral solutions is well known. Even the FDA have tried to do something about that without a great deal of success, but they recognize that this is a real problem. People already susceptible for whatever reason, and that's why they're having to receive parental nutrition, are then being loaded with aluminium. Lovely. That's got to be a good thing. The absorption across the gut is limited. It must be less than 0.1%. It's probably 0.05% of the total aluminium that enters the gut. And for many, many years, People have thought that's the only way aluminium gets into the body. My personal opinion is now it's simply one way. It's no longer the only way, and I'm not even convinced it's the major way. Those of you who like to partake, either in this, the legal or illegal forms of smoking, we're pleased to know that after you've had your cigarette or your spliff, that your next urine sample will have more aluminium in it than the one you had before. Yep, and Jesus would have been the same. <laughs> and potentially the worrying thing about that is, of course, that you're taking that aluminium in in your cigarette fumes either directly over the lung, which means that it doesn't have to go through the liver before it can go to your brain and other places, or indeed you're taking it through your olfactory system which can, gives you direct access to the hippocampus without having to cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, it's no coincidence that on other recreational drugs that people take them through the nose, because the hit is fast, it gets to the brain very, very quickly. So again, cocaine and heroin, you know, it's 
it's quite surreal working on heroin in the lab. And we actually had a little machine that smoked it, and we, we did chasing the dragon and all sorts of things. We couldn't tell anybody about it. I had to keep it completely. We had to have licenses, obviously, to do this. But heroin contains large amounts of aluminium. You know, people who die of heroin overdose in their 20s, we know they have all of the early signs of Alzheimer's disease in their 20s. Whether that's because they're also taking an aluminium, I don't know. But it could be an interesting coincidence. We all know about this one, and listen, I don't want to be unsociable, so I put it under my arms as well. Aluminium salts are the most effective antiperspirant known to man, and that is why they have persisted. The Unilever and all these companies that make them have desperately tried to find something else to replace the aluminium because they know deep down it's not good to have all that one gram of aluminium under each arm every morning. They know it's not good. They know because of people like Richard Flaren's work that some of that aluminium ends up in your urine um, sometime later. So we know we do absorb it across there. But hey, I'm still putting it there, so... I don't know what the alternative is at the moment. <laughs> and I do wash, by the way. There is so much aluminium in uh, medications. Some of which, of course, you know because it's an antacid, it's made of aluminium. But how many people know that your aspirin is full of aluminium, particularly anything that says buffered on it? Because aspirin is very poorly absorbed in the gut. If it hits pH 2, it really is very poorly absorbed. But if it hits pH 2, but you've also got a buffer in there, which can actually raise the pH up to about 4-ish, the absorption is potentiated. So that's why we now have some really fast, effective aspirins that work very quickly because of the buffering that aluminium salts give when they're added to get given together. I'll give you a quick throwaway point. We're doing some work at the moment on the aluminium content of drugs for people with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. Is there aluminium in those drugs? You bet. It may take us another 12 months to publish this and finish the work, but you bet there is. So we're giving people with, who are, essentially have diseases which could be related to aluminium exposure, we're giving them aluminium in their drugs. And for Alzheimer's disease, these are drugs that do no use anyway. Sunscreens and sun, uh, sun creams and sunblocks. I never use these things for many reasons. If I start talking about this now and coincidence of melanoma and the use of sunscreens and this perfect curve that we've seen quite a few of, causal or not, they do contain large amounts of aluminium. Aluminium is a pro-oxidant. Both the, sun, both the active UV barrier protector and the aluminium get into the lower areas of the skin where they can act together to produce a pro-oxidant effect. Whether that has anything to do with melanoma, I don't know. But it's there, and if you, one day on the beach, you, if you follow World Health Organization guidelines on these products, you will put about five grams of aluminium on your body. This is our latest work on baby feeds, quite unbelievable and almost more unbelievable that no one wants to do anything about it. So in the, United, in, in the European Union, we can have 200 micrograms of aluminium per litre in our water, so that is a maximum level. I think it's probably the same in the States. 50 is the recommended amount, 50 micrograms per litre. These are not health-based things, but they are still legislated. And it's the only legislation for aluminium that exists, actually, with respect to human health. However, in baby feeds, you've got orders of magnitude more aluminium in every major baby feed that we looked at. And we looked at the 15 most popular baby feeds in the United Kingdom. And the one that had the highest amount of aluminium in it, nearly one milligram per litre, five times the amount that would be normally allowed at the maximum water was for preterm babies. Preterm babies. How much? 
Hmm? Nearly, n nearly one milligram per liter. Of course, here we are in our, where we are today. So that is an also an exposure. And we also know from the work of Richard Flarand that aluminium in adjuvants does appear in our urine. So we know that it does get all over the body. So living in the aluminium age does ensure our body burden of aluminium. And our body burden is, is everywhere, but there are certain places where it's most likely to accumulate. So for example, you, know, you rub your arm, you remove quite a few skin cells. In doing so, you slough off quite a lot of aluminium that's in those skin cells. In other words, any cell preparation which is turned over quite quickly, there is less chance for aluminium to accumulate. Those cells or tissues where they are not turned over quite so quickly, or not turned over at all, such as your neurons, these are obvious targets for the accumulation of aluminium. So the brain, the neurons, things like the bone, things like macrophages, things like heart cells, long-lived tissues and cells are obvious targets for an accumulation of aluminium. The question then arises, of course, now, probably one of the reasons why aluminium adjuvants are so effective is that they do initially, because it's quite a high concentration, you're putting in 0.5 mg of aluminium into a very small area, small area of interstitial fluid, so that concentration initially is very high. You produce a localized effect which could then cascade as it gets diluted into the lymph, other interstitial fluids, the rest of the body. In other words, probably for adjuvants to work effectively, there is some sort of threshold. There is a threshold effect. Now that threshold effect can also apply anywhere in the body. So wherever you have an accumulation of aluminium which perhaps exceeds a threshold which is as yet unknown, then that accumulation of aluminium could act as an adjuvant and it could act as an antigen. What do, how does that impact on our thinking and what we're thinking about today? I mean, I just put this one up because the brain is an area that we're working on quite a lot and we were recently invited to review aluminium in the human brain. We've been invited because we're actually doing the largest study of the aluminium content of human brain ever, ever attempted at the moment where we will probably manage to get about 100 human brains analyzed. We've done about 80 or so at the moment, and then our funding, well, our funding ran out actually in December, so we'll have to stop. But even 100 brains looking at all four lobes, we're going to present some very exciting data on how much aluminum there is in the brain. But more importantly than how much is where is it? Because it's focal accumulations that really matter. Because those act both potentially as thresholds and also as sources for biologically reactive aluminium. And this schematic is just to give you some example of how potentially complicated it is. And you know, politicians love using this word complex, so I try not to use it. Because actually, it might not be so complex, it's just that when you don't know, it does appear so. I think when we do know, it will be relatively simple. I know that sounds like a bit of a paradox in itself, but I think that is the case. It's only our lack of knowledge which makes this look complicated. Here is an example of an accumulation of aluminium in a human brain. What we've actually got here is a plaque which is about hmm, getting on for 70, 80 microns across. And the area that's stained bluish purple shows the presence of aluminium. The area stained red shows the presence of a protein called beta amyloid, which is implicated in Alzheimer's disease. But I show this particular picture only as this could be, for example, sitting in the brain, this could surpass a threshold for aluminium being an adjuvant and, or antigen in the brain. Just imagine 
you have a higher than normal body burden of aluminium. You are potentially accumulating it in certain areas in the body. You then receive multiple vaccinations, all of which contain some aluminium. In those multiple vaccinations, aluminium is acting as adjuvant and antigen. It sets off cascades of potential responses, which I believe potentially can then cascade around the body, setting off potentially other stores of aluminium, whether they be in the brain or the bone, the connective tissue, the places where we might expect to find high or raised levels of aluminium. Could this type of cascade effect explain why an aluminium adjuvant could then, in some individuals only, produce such adverse effects and such generalized adverse effects? And many of the adverse effects that you see in people who have suffered following vaccination are very similar to the known effects of aluminium intoxication. So we do have situations of aluminium intoxication and we do see many similar effects such as the chronic fatigue, the muscle spasms, many things that aluminium is known to produce. This is the paper that's uh, available online but not, I don't quite have all the, the rest of the details yet. Anyway, there's some good news. Even if what I said was bad news, there is still some good news. The good news is that, of course, we have the excretion side of things. We are pretty damn good at keeping aluminium out of our body, but, but we don't manage it. However, the urine could well save us. We have fridges full of human urine. It's not so bad when it's cold. It's working with it when it's got back to room temperature that uh, people object to. I have one student, she's doing an absolutely fantastic job. I'll show you a little bit of her work in a second, who has done this for three years. And what a challenge that is, working with human urine for three years. She's working on human urine for three years because a few years ago, we published a paper which showed a very simple way to get aluminium out of human beings. If you give them a, 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 a mineral water, which is rich in silicon, rich in something called silicic acid, SiOH4, the biologically available form of silicon, they pee aluminium in their urine. You can titrate aluminium from your body with a silicon-rich mineral water. And in this case, we were able to show we could do so in people with Alzheimer's disease. We now have programs up and running for healthy volunteers, people in their 20s. We have a program up and running for Alzheimer's disease where we're extending the period of time over which they are taking the silicon-rich mineral water to around 13 weeks. And we're just starting a program for Parkinson's disease. Again, without, I'm not giving anything away by telling you that we have, are going to be and have already been successful in removing aluminium from all of these types of people by simply giving you something you can buy on the supermarket shelf. I'm going to break all protocol and tell you that the one water that worked incredibly well was a vo water called Volvic in the United Kingdom, made by a French company called Volvic. Made by a French company called Danone. But I can't tell you that now because since Danone went into an agreement with us to work in this area, they then told me they no longer want to work with us. They no longer want to be associated with the possibility that aluminium, removal of aluminium might be an important thing. They will benefit from it at some point because they are one of the few companies that have a silicon rich mineral water. The one that we work with as well is a company called Spritzer who will be more than me happy for me to mention them in, in Asia and uh, based in Malaysia. And their, their mineral water is even more effective than Volvic. It contains even more silicon. There are no downsides to silicon. Silicon is good. Silicic acid, SiOH4, is good. I haven't got time to tell you why, but believe you me, it is. And here's a quick snapshot. This is just one individual. And all we really need to see, we've got excretion of si silicon in the urine. That's the black. We've got excretion of aluminium and other metals in the urine. The aluminium is the red. 
against time for, a, for an individual having drunk a silicon-rich mineral water. I think we can all see that the aluminium and the silicon come out together. We have this for about 25 healthy controls, males and females now. It's very difficult data to do sort of stats on, you're not sure whether you're going to do it on single individual, you're going to try and put it all together, because everybody's physiology is different, so we're working on that. So I'm just showing you one example. But we know that you drink a silicon-rich mineral water, you pee aluminium. It's absolutely, I'm absolutely confident if you included a silicon-rich mineral water in your everyday diet, that most of us could get our aluminium contents down to as close to inverted commas normal as possible. Like many of you, I am contacted on a regular basis by people who have been adversely affected, sometimes by vaccination but, and other aluminium-related issues. I have been contacted by parents of girls who have taken the um, human papillomavirus um, um, vaccination, and they have said, is there anything we can do? Is it got anything to do with aluminium? I don't tell them it's got anything to do with aluminium. That's not my role. I am not a doctor. I would simply tell them, look, if there is anything to do with aluminium, try taking a silicon-rich mineral water. I tell them which one. I am increasingly getting emails back. Six months, a year later, they're telling me that their daughter is better. I'm not making this up. Their daughter is better. I say, well, it might have had something to do with that. It might just be something else that you're doing, but that's great news. So anecdotally, at least, we're getting good results here. We need, of course, to get proper scientific data as well for people potentially getting better simply by drinking a silicon-rich mineral water. Thank you very much. Thank you.